welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, I chat with Alessandro Chiesa, a professor working on cryptography, complexity, and security. He is also a co-founder at Zcash and Starkware. Ale has taught many of our previous guests, and in this episode, we explore some of the work that has come out of his lab. We also touch on the challenge of creating educational resources around SNARKs, especially since it is moving and changing so quickly. We also look at which parts of SNARK understanding are somewhat stable and which parts are still very much open problems to be studied further. This also happens to be the Zero Knowledge Podcast's 200th episode. And to be honest, it kind of snuck up on me. Still, I'm so excited that for this episode, we have a deep ZK topic and an expert guest. Seems very fitting. I hope you enjoy. But before we start in, I also want to let you know about ZK Hack. ZK Hack is a multi-round online event with workshops and puzzle-solving competitions. It's put together by this podcast and the ZK Validator. It's supported by a slew of fantastic sponsors, many of them ZK projects from the space. It will kick off a weekly cadence starting October 26, 2021. Think Hackathon meets CTF meets Dark Forest round-based competition. There will be a leaderboard and there will be prizes, as well as deep dive learning sessions with the best teams in the space. So do head over to the website now to join. And if you happen to be in Lisbon at the end of this month for the Lisbon Blockchain Week over there, be sure to check out the ZK Hack Party. Together with Alio and Enoma, we're throwing this in-person event, a little bit as like a pre-party to the ZK Hack event itself. So yeah, do check it out. We'll be sharing links on our Twitter, Telegram. We'll probably put some links in here once we have them as well. Hope to see you at the ZK Hack and possibly at the ZK Hack Party. I would also like to thank this week's sponsor, Centrifuge. Centrifuge puts real-world assets on the blockchain, allowing issuers to get liquidity on their assets and investors to make safe, stable yields in the volatile crypto world. It's built on Substrate, but they also bridge between Ethereum and Polkadot. Centrifuge are currently hiring for a number of positions, including protocol engineer, product manager, full-stack engineer, security, and DevOps engineer. Do check out the link in the show notes to find out about all of their jobs, and I want to say a big thank you again, Centrifuge, for sponsoring the show. Now, here is the 200th episode of the Zero Knowledge Podcast with our guest, Alessandro, talking all about SNARK research and education. So today I'm here with Alessandro Chiesa, a professor working on cryptography, complexity, and security. He's also the co-founder of Zcash and Starkware. And actually, Ale, you've been on the show before. So welcome back to the Zero Knowledge Podcast. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. It's wonderful to be back. So that last time that we had you on the show, you were mainly here speaking with Ellie about Starkware and the research that you had done leading up to the project. What we didn't really get to cover in that episode was your other academic work. So you've been running a lab, the Laboratory for Computational Security. It's produced a lot of research. A lot of your students have come on this show to describe some of the work that they're doing. And actually, any subscriber to the ZK Mesh newsletter may be familiar with your name because you've authored or co-authored a lot of the research that ends up in that newsletter. So yeah, quite excited to dig into all of this with you. But yeah, to start off, I'd love to learn more about the lab and explore what you and your students have been developing and exploring in the last little while. Sure. Yeah. So I started uh, working as a professor uh, six years ago. And uh, so it's now a good chunk of time. And uh, over this period, I've been uh, working on uh, ramping up and running uh, a research program that touches on uh, many aspects of uh, cryptographic proofs, primarily SNARKs. And what do I mean by many aspects is that the research frontiers in this topic concern uh, uh, basic mathematical questions in uh, low degree testing, linearity testing. These are uh, sort of a, a bread and butter of where the succinctness of SNARKs come from. To other topics in cryptography, how do you take probabilistic proofs uh, like PCPs, interactive proofs, and uh, um, interactive oracle proofs, and you convert these to argument systems. And so there's the theory and foundations of uh, these uh, transformations. And then there's the applied aspect that moves sort of further from cryptography into applied cryptography and uh, uh, system security 
which is uh, studying the practical aspects of uh, these constructions and how to use them inside protocols to achieve interesting goals like private peer-to-peer -peer payments like in Zcash. Mm. And as part of running this group, I've been trying to <laughs> get uh, sort of strong students interested with a variety of backgrounds, maybe more on the theory side or more on the applied side, and to kind of learn as much as possible the ins and outs of probabilistic proofs, SNARKs, so we can push the frontiers uh, across this whole spectrum in a way that uh, takes advantage of the fact that not only we understand the theory, but we also understand the practice. And so we can sort of in a coherent way push the boundary of SNARKs. Cool. How would you break it down in the lab? Like how much is theory, how much is actually applied? Would you do 50-50 or do you think it's more focused on the theory side? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, what I found is that uh, it takes several theory papers in order to get, uh, you know, a smaller number of good applied papers. And out of those, there is a smaller number of useful protocols in the real world. Okay. The way that I've been operating that I find is useful is more biased towards the theory because there that's where we want to push frontiers of like difficult questions and we don't want to be restrained by whether it's immediately practical or not, that might be a mm -hmm. concern that will come later. It may never be, but at least we're making an attempt to push the frontier. And then usually sort of solving a hard question in the theory world will inevitably force you to come up with new tools. And then what has happened time and again is that some of these tools, maybe not necessarily as invented for the theory, but morally, they're those same tools end up being useful in applied contexts. So a great example here is... Uh, Actually, my first paper in, uh, I wrote in 2009 was about recursive proof composition of SNARKs, actually. Oh, wow. And at the time, it looked very much only theoretical. And in that paper, we formulated this notion of proof carrying data, which was sort of capturing what can be done with uh, SNARKs in a recursive way. And it took maybe till the end of my PhD to have a first implementation, never mind practical, so like a running implementation of a recursing SNARKs. And it took another few years for these to become practical enough to be useful in the real world. But in the meantime, there was like a lot of theory that was done to enable mm -hmm. a little bit of applied cryptography, to enable you know, a few systems uh, in the real world to take advantage of the recursive SNARKs. So, and there's several examples of these that I can see over the past. Now, I've been working in this uh, racket for uh, 12 years, <laughs> uh, six years as a, you know, before a professor and six years as a professor. And there's many examples of these where I see that a lot of effort on theory. If you sort of tackle the hard questions, then you will be able later to pick up uh, new techniques and then uh, leverage them for advances in uh, applied cryptography. Cool. I mean, nowadays, recursive snarks, you can actually see them very much in the wild, too. Like, I believe Filecoin is using recursive snarks. Mina is built around this concept of recursive snarks. Are those the same kinds of versions of what you had been working on? Or did you see, like, people kind of working on this in parallel? Or is this really kind of like your work would have been the foundation for some of this stuff? Uh, well, the basic definitions, such as uh, what is proof carrying data, mostly remain the same. Even articulating what is the goal of what you get once you recurse a snark, it's actually not so simple. Once you see it, then, then it makes sense. That's proof carrying data. The techniques to achieve proof carrying data have evolved, as it should be the case. And uh, even, uh, and it's not just in practice, even uh, let's say from a theoretical cryptography standpoint, what kind of primitives suffice to imply proof carrying data has become uh, weaker and weaker. For example, maybe back in the day, in order to build proof carrying data, you would need what we would call a fully succinct snark. So a snark that to, when proving the correct computation of a machine running time t, the verifier will run in time polylog t with no preprocessing, no nothing, just like that. That was the first instantiation of proof carrying data. But with time, we've been able to relax some of these uh, requirements by having a more sophisticated and careful uh, construction. So for example, the first relaxation was from polylogarithmic verifier to merely sublinear, okay? And that was mm. not clear a priori that it would be enough, okay? Uh, another relaxation was saying, well, maybe we're not going to have a fully succinct snark. We're going to rely on pre-processing of circuits. That's something that wasn't considered in the beginning, but later, because in practice, the first snarks to be practical were the ones with pre-processing. We had to understand how to do recursion with pre-processing. So that was something that was understood first in theory and then in practice. Mm. And perhaps most recently, there was uh, this line of work uh, starting uh, with Halo and then accumulation schemes, where even the fact that the verifier needs to be sublinear was removed, and now we can do recursion 
even with a linear time verifier, but there's no compression, okay? But somehow there is so-called accumulation that uh, you're never really compressing anything. You're just uh, batching multiple statements into one new statement, and then in the end, you will have some verification check that uh, is not smaller than any given node. It's the size of each of the nodes you had along the way, uh, but that's fine because you have it at the end, and at least you're not paying for the length of the chain, for instance. Mm -hmm. That Halo case, this is actually something I wanted to talk to you about, this interaction between industry and academia. So Halo came out of the Zcash engineering group. I think they were trying to solve like a very problem right in front of them. They used engineering techniques. And then I know that there was a paper published that you're a co-author on, this proof carrying data without succinct arguments. And I know that this came out, I think, I mean, we published in the ZK Mesh back in February. And I know that like, when that came out, it was like the formalization of what Halo had done. And yeah, this was kind of this interesting moment where you saw like a company or like an industry kind of like propose something and then academia formalize it. Do you see that happening a lot or do you feel like most of the time it's the other way? It, it's a ping pong. Uh, so okay. it goes through cycles. Perhaps another, maybe perhaps even more serious interaction that impacted a lot my research program was when we were collaborating with the electric coin company team to deploy Zcash, <laughs> it became clear that uh, these trusted setups in the real world, especially the ones old style that were circuit specific and not, not updatable, were really, really difficult to mm -hmm. deploy. And this is not at all clear. Like with my sort of, let's say, classical cryptographic training as a graduate student initially, having a common reference string or a structured reference string, how it's called today, was a normal thing that nobody would worry about. Okay, It was like a normal setting. But once you were confronted with uh, realizing this in a peer-to-peer -peer setting, it became, this was a major issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, it made me and my colleagues uh, very interested in trying to address this. So this was, for example, a direct motivation for a, a paper that was written for a tailored multi-party computation protocol to sample the reference string for Zcash. Uh, this was the paper that was then uh, sort of the basis for the protocol that was actually run, that was uh, further developed and designed, uh, I think, by Sean and Dara, and then run in the real world. But more than that, I sort of rekindled my interest into SNARGs based on almost nothing, let's say random functions that have this bare bones uh, setup is just like a strong cryptographic hash function. And in some mm. sense, the birth of interactive Oracle proofs was a, I view it in my mind as uh, some uh, side effect of the struggles of dealing with uh, reference strings. I was personally motivated and I believe some of my colleagues were as well to kind of go back to these, what were unfortunately very expensive constructions and what could we do about it? And, Somehow we, we found this way of saying, wait, what if we, instead of building PCPs, we build PCPs across multiple rounds? And this led to the idea of an interactive Oracle proof, which ultimately in a span of five years from formulating the notion of an IOP and then lots of research on IOPs has led to what are now quite efficient SNARKs that not really rely on any structure reference string. All you need is a hash function. To me, that was, it would not have happened, or at least I don't believe I would have worked as hard on the direction of uh, IOPs if I hadn't experienced and seen how ECC had to overcome this huge barrier of reference string. Mm. Very much of a motivator. Can you give me a little bit of an example of an interactive Oracle proof version? Like, do you still need a trusted setup, but they're just way, way more efficient? Or is this the replacement for a trusted setup when you say that? An interactive Oracle proof is the probabilistic proof that is used inside certain types of snarks. All snarks must have a trusted setup. There do not exist snarks without setup. So we can only talk yeah. about the colors of setups. Some colors are nicer mm -hmm. than others, okay? The best you can hope for is just a little bit of randomness in the sky, right? Just uh, say 100 random bits or 500 random bits that we can all agree upon were random. For example, you could pick the first so many digits of pi and call that you know, uh, randomness. Mm -hmm. This is very easy to agree upon it and deploy it. And such types of snarks arise from using the random Oracle model to compile either PCPs or IOPs, which are a translation of that, okay? So this is the most desirable type of setup because there is no ceremony to run, right? I mean, yeah, you could run a coin tossing protocol, but nobody's gonna do that, okay? What you're really going to do instead is say, I don't know, SHA of 
I don't know, Alessandro Chiesa, that we're going to give you some output and that's, you know, random looking enough and nobody's going to think that Alessandro Chiesa as a byte string holds a trapdoor for SHA so that he creates some uh, a weird looking random string that then the snark will uh, will be broken under, right? I see. So what you're saying is like, there is always a trusted setup, but like the trusted setup using IOPs is almost like it can actually be more safely run by an org. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to do the multi-party computation yeah. with all these different participants. Right, IOP-based snarks, right? Because okay. uh, like a PCP is yeah, just some, some idealized uh, information static model. You cannot really use it. I wish we could, but we can't because uh, the verifier needs to do things that it cannot do in the real world. Then you use cryptography to kind of implement what the verifier should have had to do. You implement it using the random oracle. And in the real world, the random oracle is just something like SHA-256. And so as long as we agree that we're all going to use SHA-256, that is the setup, right? It's much easier to agree on the hash function than it is to agree on, uh, I don't know, like a bunch of powers of some group element that have some structure, right? So, Can you give me some examples of protocols that maybe have been proposed that are IOP-based snarks? Like, would Marlin go in under this or Fractal? One of them, that yes, and the other one not. <laughs> Fractal, so, yes, Marlin, so, no, yeah. I think. So Mar Marlin <laughs> uses uh, something that is called a algebraic or polynomial IOP. Is essentially, it is an IOP where we give a little bit of extra power to the verifier that rather than accessing, let's say, strings by querying locations, it accesses polynomials by querying their values. So unfortunately, we don't know how to compile, it's, let's say, in a practically interesting way, polynomial IOPs into snarks by just using hash functions, okay? Mm -hmm. We know how to do it using, say, groups of unknown order, but I'm not going to get into the difficulties of uh, uh, practical aspects of them. So instead, what we do is we use things like pairing or groups, prime order groups that, where the discrete logarithm is hard, to compile them. And so that's what Marlin is, okay? In Fractal, it is actually based on an IOP, okay? It is mm -hmm. a pre-processing snark for our 1CS, that is obtained by taking an IOP for our one cs and compiling it with hash functions, okay? So that one is, uh, it's not used in practice. I think it's a, you know, it's a very nice protocol. It does what it's uh, supposed to do, which is uh, like a pre-processing snark for our one cs But perhaps mm -hmm. more familiar to the audience will be systems deployed by Starkware. So cryptographic proofs are snarks that are obtained from some type of IOP. Rather the IOP being for our one cs it is for an, another language called AIR, algebraic intermediate representation, which is, you can think about it, some sort of algebraic machine. Uh, so there's no pre-processing there. There is some sort of uniform model of computation that uh, looks like some uh, algebraic machine. So these things are, are practical. They're running, they've been running on Ethereum mainnet for now maybe a couple of years. And um, that's one of the nice things in uh, that commercialization effort. There wasn't an issue about how you deploy the setup. Well, we just have to decide what the hash function is and that's it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so we just mentioned a number of works from student of yours. These are the kinds of works and research papers that I sort of mentioned earlier in the show. But can we talk a little bit about who some of those researchers are and the type of projects and even like full-fledged protocols that have come out of the work that you've been doing? Because I think what's interesting also to our audience is we've featured a lot of people who have gone through your lab uh, on this show. And so it might be cool to make those links. I have some uh, projects that I very much uh, enjoyed uh, working on. One of them, uh, for sure, is uh, Aurora. This is a project uh, with uh, several of uh, my students. First one is a longtime collaborator of mine, Eli Ben Sasson, which should be familiar to everyone in the audience, as well as uh, uh, Mikhail Yabzev, who was a student uh, of Eli Ben Sasson, also co-founder of Starkware. And then Nick Spooner, a former student mm -hmm. of mine, Madas Virza, collaborator of mine uh, from my MIT days, and uh, Nicholas Ward, also another former student of mine. And uh, what was very cool about this project is that when we formulated the notion of IOPs, at the time, we didn't really have very interesting IOP examples. Um, and uh, at some point, we started thinking we were able to design some interesting IOPs, but primarily they were for uh, machine computations. And the problem with machine computations is that at the time, we didn't really have very good ways to encode interesting problems that people would care about, such as at the time that maybe the example was the Zcash circuit, right? As a machine computation, just doesn't look like that. There's like a, it really is more of a circuit computation, okay? And we did not have very good techniques for coming up with practically relevant 
IOPs for circuit-like computations. And at least in um, my mind, the Aurora paper was the first one where we were able to say, okay, here's an instance of Aurora 1CS, and we have like a direct protocol for it that we are able to implement and get some reasonable efficiency for. And uh, one of the things that we came up with in the protocol was this uh, univariate sum check, okay, which was uh, solving the problem of uh, how to convince a verifier that a polynomial sums over a big domain to a certain claimed sum, even though the polynomial has one variable, unlike the multivariate sum check well known from the 80s. And this univariate sum check was the sort of, let's say, the main engine of practicality uh, inside Aurora. And it was later used in uh, many other protocols uh, thereafter. Both Fractal and Marlin ended up using it. And uh, so it taught us a lot, even though Aurora itself I view Aurora as an example of a theoretical exploration that actually did have some practical implementation, but it was not quite practical enough for usage. For example, the verifier was not sublinear, had a linear time mm. verifier. So it was not a pre-processing snark. But the techniques that we had to come up with to design a, an IOP for R1CS were later very influential in many of the other works that uh, we did in the, the research group. I was at the time very, very excited. I felt like we finally we're putting our hands on techniques that uh, were going to be useful uh, uh, later on. I mean, recently we did a study club on some work you did with some checks. Was, was that in any way like coming out of this original research? Was that like the formalization of some part of it? Actually, it's uh, unrelated, but I can uh, talk about oh. that because uh, maybe it is uh, interesting. So <laughs> Pattern matching here. <laughs> some check-like anyway. techniques play an unreasonably large role in the design of SNARKs, uh, primarily because SNARKs contain probabilistic proofs, there are ways to formalize the statement. And so, and, uh, and some check protocols play an important role in probabilistic proofs. So that's, that's why they show up. And broadly speaking, what you do as a sum check, how you design a, a sum check protocol depends on whether you're tackling, you want to do the sum check for a multivariate polynomial or a univariate polynomial. For the multivariate polynomial, we have an answer already from the 80s. And for univariate polynomial, we had this univariate sum check. And uh, we were interested in univariate techniques because primarily of Fry, right? Fry is a Lodigy testing protocol for univariate polynomials. It's very practical. That's why in Aurora, we were focusing on that. Right now, you were mentioning a recent work that I'm actually very excited about. Yeah. And it's, uh, it came about from a quite different um, motivation. And it has to do with uh, a work that I was not involved in, which is the design of uh, bullet proofs. Bullet proofs yeah. is a logarithmic communication uh, argument system with a linear time uh, verifier, also linear time prover, based on uh, discrete logarithms. Right? It's a very influential work. Uh, it's uh, range proofs based on bullet proofs, uh, for example, used in Monero. And I was personally quite interested in the protocol because unlike most other snark constructions out there, it does not prominently display an inner probabilistic proof compiled into a, a succinct argument, okay? There are some ways to maybe force it out, but it feels unnatural. Mm. And at least I think that one of the difficulties of coming up with uh, maybe post-quantum versions of bulletproofs were directly related to the fact that maybe we didn't quite fully understand uh, bulletproofs. And in a, in a recent work with uh, two postdocs, uh, a former postdoc of mine, uh, Jonathan Butel, who is also co-author of bulletproofs, and Katerina Sotiraki, uh, who is uh, uh, currently a postdoc at uh, UC Berkeley, formerly a, a student at MIT with uh, Vinod Vakuntanathan. We were very interested in, uh, in designing a post-quantum analog of bulletproofs. And the way we went about trying to tackle that, rather than trying to directly design some lattice-based uh, protocol, we went back and tried to understand what was really going on in bulletproofs. And we made some, what I think is a very exciting uh, sort of finding, which actually one can view in retrospect bulletproofs, literally the sum check protocol run on a cryptographically hard group with some consistency check at the end. And you can actually like phrase it like that, okay? Mm. And it was just a sum check in disguise that interestingly was not run on the usual domains like finite fields, but on uh, in some basically rings, okay? By sort of understanding the protocol at a higher level abstraction, we were able to basically push it at a high enough abstraction layer that then we could then instantiate it with completely different domains, polynomial rings oh, wow. where there are hardness assumptions on lattices. For example, the short integer solution problem is hard, okay? 
I think all of us on the paper were very happy about this uh, discovery or invention because it somehow helped us explain in a coherent way, like a long line of works that was working on bulletproof style protocols, making all kinds of observations that were also shared by some check-based protocols. They were talking about space efficiency or round around soundness and all these things that bulletproof style protocols were uh, having also, some check protocols have, but there was no real reason, there's no clear reason why they both have these properties. Now there is one. Now you know. That's so cool. Actually, yeah, so we did a study club on that. Yeah, I'll so. add the link in the show notes so that anyone can like dig in deeper to this particular problem. I do want to go back to maybe some other projects that came out of the lab that you would like to highlight, because I know you had a couple in mind. I'd like to maybe spend a little bit of time to talk about... Uh, what I consider to be the simplest snarks. Those are snarks built just from random oracles. I have a little question because you're saying the word snarg and not snark. I wanted to make a quick distinction there because I know like in a lot of your work, you are using this snarg. So it's S-N-A-R-G. Well, first, I'm not being careful in this discussion. <laughs> when I'm being careful, the G <laughs> simply means that I'm not highlighting the proof knowledge property. And the K means that uh, for whatever okay. reason, I'm trying to highlight the proof knowledge property. Uh, but uh, please don't pay attention to the difference in this uh, sort of high level discussion. I may be saying snarg or snark. Okay. Um, yeah. It's uh, interchangeable. For discussion. Then. Yes. From a technical perspective, it specifically means whether you require proof of knowledge or not. Got it. So this goes back to snarks with, let's say, the simplest types of setups, just a hash function, right? So I find these fascinating for multiple reasons. First, we will always have hash functions, maybe 100 years from now, 500 years from now, 1,000 years from, from now, regardless of what happens with supercomputers or quantum computers or whatever computers, it is likely we will always have hash functions that are sort of secure enough for doing uh, hashing of things so you get random outputs, okay? It's not clear that the same will be true about uh, the hardness of discrete logarithms, the hardness of factoring, problems about lattices, hard problems about isogenies, we don't know, right? There's structure in, in these problems due to geometry or number theory that can be exploited by adversaries. But hash functions, it is reasonable to believe we'll always have them. So in some sense, progress in snargs based on hash functions is, I view it as most fundamental, or at least in the sense that it will stick with us for the longest amount of time. So the holy grail, in some sense, is understanding what is the best possible snark based on hash functions that we can obtain. And if that snark based on hash functions is good enough for practice, then we can actually make it part of digital infrastructure without worrying about whether we'll have to swap it out in the future or not. Okay? And because you can actually study hash functions in this idealized model of a random function, that is a random oracle, we can actually make very precise questions about what is possible and not possible for such snarks. And there is a line of work, for example, with a co-author, Elon Yogev, who, <laughs> by the time this airs, might have already given a ZK study club on this topic. A study club. <laughs> where we basically cool. study the uh, capabilities and limitations of, of, of these primitives. Uh, for example, we prove that any snark in the random oracle model must have a verifier that makes more than a constant number of queries to the random oracle. This, in some sense, is a barrier to recursion, because whenever you recurse a snark, you will have to express the verifier in terms of elementary gates to prove things about it, right? Mm -hmm. Which means that if you have many calls to the random oracle, then you will pay more in the circuit of the verifier, okay? And so that's like a barrier that says that there are limitations to how efficient these things can be for recursion. A major open question that is, uh, I think, one of my favorite questions right now is whether do there exist snarks in the random oracle model with linear size? What do I mean linear size? Linear in the security parameter. We do know that the answer is yes in other models. For example, based on discrete logarithms or based on pairings, we essentially know that the answer is yes. We have linear or nearly linear proof size. That's also why in the real world they actually have smaller size because asymptotically we actually see that. For example, GROT16 has a constant number of group elements. Those group elements have size that is a linear and security parameter. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, you need to pick the embedding degree of the curve to be large enough, but once you do that, then it is linear. And so, in asymptotically instead, the best snarks that we know today in the random oracle model are at least quadratic. In fact, the practical ones are closer to cubic. 
that's why things based on random oracles have proof sizes that are more like in the tens of kilobytes rather than a few kilobytes. That is exactly why. Is an example of that Starks then? They're quadratic or even cubic. Exactly. They're at least quadratic and a little bit more than that because, yeah, there's okay. other reasons. And so that's why you, you see this like maybe 30 kilobytes or 40 kilobytes rather than two kilobytes, okay? Like once you have ironed out your concretely efficient constructions, the asymptotics speak and you will feel them in the real world, okay? And so there's a fundamental question, you know, is it possible, let's say, to have maybe a long time from now, a one kilobyte Stark, right? Wow. That question is basically, in some sense, are there snarks in the random work model with linear size? And kind of the common belief is that because you have to ask many queries to the IOP, and each query needs to be certified by a path in the Merkle tree used to commit to the oracles, there is an inherent quadratic barrier because you have to ask security parameter number of queries, and each query is certified by a digest that is at least size of the security parameter, you're going to get security parameter squared, okay? And a recent work uh, with uh, Elon Yugev, the work that uh, he will talk about or will have talked about in the Zika Study Club, we're able to construct a snark that has a subquadratic size, slightly subquadratic, it's not linear. And <laughs> we just don't know what the right answer is. Like uh, we've broken the quadratic barrier, so some of the common belief that quadratic is inherent is not the right answer. We have something slightly subquadratic, um, and <laughs> the jury is out about whether this strange expression that we obtain is actually the right one, or one can do even better and obtain linear. And uh, I think it's a beautiful open question, and uh, somehow any progress in this direction will be in some sense eternal. Like it, we will always have hash functions, and any un further understanding we have will benefit us forever. What is the name of this work, just for reference point for anyone listening? Sure. This work appears in Crypto of this year, and the title is Subquadratic Snargs in the Random Oracle Model. Perfect. Cool. And we remain very interested in this question, and we'll keep thinking about ways to uh, either prove that there is some inherent superlinear lower bound on the size of arguments in the Random Oracle Model, or uh, we can improve uh, the, the upper bound with like better constructions. Uh, right now, we don't know. This kind of goes to the question of like how you're picking what you're doing, but do you look at a protocol and then like there's pieces of it and you start to optimize or think about specific pieces? Is it more like you're starting with a clean slate and you're trying to kind of build something brand new? I'm just curious like how you approach some of these problems. Uh, well, definitely not a clean slate. That would be, <laughs> that would be, that would be wild. suicidal. <laughs> uh, so I think a common theme that... Uh, I use for myself and I try to, I think it's a powerful theme and I try to teach to younger co-authors is modularity and deep understanding. So just the fact that you have a protocol you can prove secure and is doing something interesting does not mean you're done. If you just mm. try to digest it and understand where does it come from, why does it exist, you will understand that actually it is not just some isolate or some cool hack from a prior protocol, if you're actually doing something interesting, there are going to be deeper reasons for why that exists. And time and again, in uh, research that I've done with colleagues, it has always, always been the case that when you try to understand something better, you are actually making uh, like a- Making more problems for yourself or? <laughs> no, 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 like you're not making, you're actually simplifying, like it gives you a better platform to then make further understanding later. And also sometimes you thought you were solving a problem and you did, but by understanding it better, you actually solve the problem more. Maybe like uh, you understand that uh, actually you achieve more than what you thought, or maybe that uh, there is some beautiful connection with another line of work. And by understanding that connection, you are able to import more techniques, maybe not in the same paper necessarily, but in, in the following one, right? And so this uh, keeping like yourself to a high bar of not just saying, do I have a theorem that I can prove, but do I understand where the theorem comes from? Why does it exist? All these kind of sanity checks and the sort of introspection of why is the world like that is, has been enormously helpful into making sure that not only we're making progress, but making progress on the hardest and most fundamental questions, as opposed to, I don't know, just random optimizations, which are useful. They can be useful for all kinds of things, but are not necessarily going to propel you forward into tackling the hard questions, right? So 
Mm. The hard questions will be, we will win over them only through deep understanding. Okay. Cool. I'll mention another uh, beautiful open problem about uh, SNARGs in the random oracle model. And that has to do with uh, constructing SNARGs that are so-called complexity preserving. So let me explain that term. Complexity preserving is a notion that uh, actually introduced with an uh, old collaborator of mine, Neil Bitansky, uh, many years ago. And uh, it, it says, suppose that you want to prove some computation that runs in time t and space s. Okay? Ideally, you would like the prover that is proving this computation to run in time and space that are close to that. Okay? What typically people do in SNARKs is to say, no, 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 like, we want the time to be close, and then we sacrifice space. So for example, anytime you use an FFT, fast Fourier transform, your space efficiency may go out the window because you will have to write everything down and then compute on it. And so if your algorithm was running in a small space, I mean, the computation you were proving was running in a small space, then you've lost that. So how can you do that? And uh, about 10 years ago, we showed the first construction that satisfies this property. Not practical at all. It was using uh, fully homomorphic encryption and multi proof interactive proofs. It was even private coin, not even publicly verifiable. But since then, there's been a few more works that have made progress on that, uh, reducing the hardness assumptions. So we know how to construct this uh, under like nice cryptographic assumptions, improving on the fact that uh, it was only private coin. Now we know how to do it with public coin. Okay. But in some sense, the hardest uh, setting of all remains to be where you have nothing but a random function. And there the problem remains open. So we don't know whether you know, we have good snarks that are time and space efficient or complexity preserving in the random oracle model. And the reason is that we don't have IOPs with that property. Uh, if we did, we could have them. And so that's like a mm. fundamental question about IOPs that remains open. Uh, it's a beautiful question. Is this a trade-off that you're describing, though, this idea of time versus space? Like, if it's longer time, would the space actually be smaller? Or is it, like, always quick time, big space? Ideally, you would like to preserve both and say that whatever was the time and space of the original computation, you want the prover proving it to run in time that is very close to that. So, for example, if the time was t and the space was s, then you want the prover of that computation to run in time say, order of t and space order of s, like roughly that. Now, one could consider, of course, the relaxations of this ideal goal and say, all right, uh, we don't know how to do that. Let's maybe play some trade-offs, and you might take a hit in your running time in order to preserve space. And in fact, that's roughly what is true today. Mm -hmm. We have constructions that are either linear time but large space, or slightly more than linear time and good space, and that's the trade-off that we have today. Uh, but we don't know how to achieve it together, even outside of the random oracle model, okay? But the work that you just recently did, does that address this question? Or is that more like this is a question that arose because of the work that you did? And you realize that this isn't something that's quite solved yet? It, this is moving on a different... Uh, before, I was focusing on the size of the argument, right, in the random oracle model. Whereas here, we are specifically asking, well, get me some decent proof size. Uh -huh. Maybe it's going to be... I don't know, cubic in the security parameter, like something succinct. But the emphasis is on the prover resources. And why? Because <laughs> time and space, they both matter. Okay, So uh, you cannot scale a snark to large computations if you have large memory constraints because you get stuck. Conversely, if you have good memory, like space complexity preservation, but your prover time sucks, then you're going to have to wait too long. Okay. And both of these are limitations in the real world. In one way or the other, they come up and they impose sort of issues on real world systems. You can try to mitigate them with systems techniques. For example, one work that I can mention is Dizik from quite a few years back. This was with uh, Howard, now at Aleo, Wenting, she's now a professor at CMU, Raluca and Jan. There we were exploring how to scale up SNARKs by spreading the prover computation on a cluster, right? The fact that it can be done doesn't mean it's easy and convenient. And the reason why we had to do it is because if you want to scale up a snark, you just run into memory constraints. Mm. And uh, you, there's just no computer that has so much memory. And you have to put together a bunch of computers that collectively have enough memory. But now you have to manage the distribution of computation and gathering the results to produce the final snark. Ideally, you, if your original computation did not have such large memory footprint, you wouldn't want the prover to have such a large memory footprint either. Yeah. 
Do you think all of these things are possible? Or do you think there will be a point where like you just get the closest approximation to what you want? <laughs> <laughs> There's almost like, can you hit that equals too? Or is that just like, that's the goal. We're going to try to like optimize until we get close enough. Uh, look, I don't know. I've definitely <laughs> had wrong intuitions before. There was a period a few years ago where I was just not convinced that there exist uh, a linear time IOPs. It just looked like mm. FFTs are there to stay. They were like in the way of everything. It just wasn't clear what to do if you're not running an FFT on a computation. And it just looked like, all right, well, I guess we don't have linear time IOPs. But things changed. There was a uh, very nice work in Asia Crypt 2017 by you know, several people, including a former postdoc of mine, uh, Jonathan Butel, uh, that showed a linear time IOP with square root time verifier. So not really like fully succinct, but you know, showing that you could do something that is towards that direction. And uh, then in a paper with Jonathan and Jens Groth, a couple of years ago, oh. we were able to bring this down from square root to any root, so like cube root or fourth root, or and more recently we were able to get polylogarithmic. So now we have a linear time IOP with polylogarithmic verification, at least for computations that are algebraic over large fields. The question for Boolean computations is still open. This was something that I did not have the intuition was possible, but somehow in the end we do have a good understanding why they're possible. <laughs> so <laughs> these things have happened several times in my career, and at this point. Mostly, I suspend my judgment. I just try to follow what seem to be the most interesting leads for a positive or negative result. Sometimes it's a negative result, like with the paper with Elon proving lower bounds on the complexity of the verifier in SNARKs in the random Oracle model. That was bad news, okay? Uh, but uh, sort of gathering intuition from the, is it a negative result or is it a positive result? is actually a useful back and forth, okay? Because uh, if you get stuck proving a negative result, that may give you like a possible uh, progress or attack or approach on the positive side and vice versa. If you kind of really get stuck on the positive result, then you might be able to somehow formulate a barrier that says, mm -hmm. as long as you will use these techniques or this approach, you cannot do better than that, right? So it's a very useful research uh, trick or strategy. Yeah. It's almost like you're framing like known possibilities, but like they don't work together yet, but this is a space that could be developed. Like we know we can do this in this context over here. Can we bring that into yeah, the yeah, context that we're reason, trying yeah. to solve in? I'll finally mention maybe two works that are not about constructing new protocols, rather they're about proving existing protocols, let's say more secure and specifically having to do with uh, quantum attackers, quantum adversaries. And here, SNARGs based on hash functions were, have been widely believed to be post-quantum in some way, because mm -hmm. if the hash function is post-quantum, why shouldn't the whole protocol be post-quantum, given that is the only cryptography that comes into the protocol? And I will not talk much about these, but I'll just mention that uh, over the past few years, there has been nice progress into formally understanding the post-quantum security of these protocols into two settings. One is a paper from uh, two years ago. It's called Succinct Arguments in the Quantum Random Oracle Model. This was uh, with uh, two students, uh, Peter Manohar, and now at CMU, and uh, Nick Spooner, where we were able to prove that uh, constructions in the Random Oracle Model based on PCPs and IOPs, for example, the ones used in Starkware, are formally secure in the Quantum Random Oracle Model, which is uh, the model where attackers can query the random function in superposition. And so now we know that gives us much stronger evidence that yes, the intuition of post-quantum security of these protocols really is there. And more recently, there's a paper with uh, Fermi Ma, who is now a postdoc at the Simons Institute at UC Berkeley, again, Nick Spooner and Mark Jandry, where we studied the, so this is not in an idealized model, this is like in a sort of a, what cryptographers call the plane model. So it's an interactive succinct argument. This is called Killian's protocol where you compile a PCP using a collision-resistant hash function into a four-message public coin succinct argument. The classical proof of security involves rewinding the adversary, but rewinding is difficult with quantum adversaries, uh, because when you start going back and forth and measuring, then the adversary notices that he is leaving uh, in a security reduction rather than wherever he was leaving, and then he stops working. Okay? 
And in this work, with uh, lots of hard work by the, 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 the two students, uh, Fermi and Nick, they really did a fantastic job. They developed new techniques for rewinding quantum algorithms. And now we do understand that uh, also in this interactive setting from plain collision resistant hash functions, or in quantum, these are things that are called collapse binding hash functions. We do understand post quantum security. And this is a long standing open problem. And so this is basically with time, we are obtaining better and better foundations, not just for now, but you know, for the long term security of these uh, uh, snarks, which are more and more part of digital infrastructure. And mm -hmm. we need them to not just be, yeah, it looks secure, or yeah, I proved it secure classically, but it should be post quantum secure. We really need to go through and uh, put all the bricks of all the foundations, uh, because if they're here to stay for a long time, especially the ones based on hash functions, they will be with us for all I know for hundreds of years. We need them to be like really understood. Yeah. So uh, I will not say more if you're interested in the post quantum security and those are two works that uh, you can look into. Cool. This actually leads us a little bit into a topic that I wanted to talk about with you. And that is teaching all of this stuff, teaching snarks, teaching zero knowledge, techniques and like basically breaking down these systems to be learned and understood. You just mentioned like, you know, there's certain things like hash functions you can assume will be with us for a long time. But then there's also other techniques that are kind of like they come, they might not be used, they might be found to be less efficient. How does that impact the way you teach? Like how can you create a syllabus or like maybe an online course that you hope would like last the test of time if this is changing so quickly. Uh, yeah, this is a complex problem. <laughs> this is the problem. And, uh, <laughs> there are various things to say here. First, uh, snarks are a rather technical area in the sense that they involve knowledge that uh, touches upon computational complexity, cryptography, and possibly also applied cryptography. Uh, so like you know, sort of an understanding of how algorithms such as multi-scalar multiplication or fast Fourier transforms or other things perform in the real world on and uh, so because it touches on so many areas, it's a bit of a challenge to train students and uh, sort of uh, bring in talent uh, who is in principle interested to understand this area, but then needs to be somewhat initiated. And so in my own uh, experience as a professor, I'm also an <laughs> sort of educator, both of uh, my own students uh, in the group and more broadly, like in classes, I've been confronted with this problem in very much directly. In particular, when I started as a professor, it was this tailored training where I would talk about what I know to students in my office. Oh, yeah. And then if a new student would come, we would have to say that again. And it would be like a very time consuming process for students and for me to communicate this knowledge. Over time, it has gotten better. I've had sort of several efforts in this direction. One effort that has, I think, come a long way is to basically take the part mm -hmm. of snarks that only has to do with computational complexity. So that is designing probabilistic proofs. I view it, in my opinion, as the technically most complex part and designing a course around it. This is a course that uh, I've taught now three times in semester courses and a fourth time in a summer school. And I've been trying to digest and reorganize a mix of uh, uh, foundational techniques and uh, modern protocols by trying to select for the ideas that seem to be most useful, most uh, productive, most uh, flexible, and leaving out maybe ideas that uh, they were maybe useful and led to nice papers, but did not seem as kind of impactful, okay? And uh, mm. what gets selected and how does it get organized? Uh, it's uh, mostly a question of experience and having an understanding of what's more foundational and what's less foundational. and. Um, yeah, it's, it's challenging, but we've come a long way. So now, for example, if you're interested in understanding probabilistic proofs, there is almost a course that is on autopilot that you can run. I guess Anna will uh, put in, uh, in the description a link to this uh, summer school from this past July, for sure. where there are 20 lectures with 20 problem sets that will teach you about interactive proofs, PCPs and IOPs, or at least what I consider to be the most foundational techniques and ideas for having a precise and deep understanding of this area. Now, there's probably another 10 or 20 lectures on top of those that one could put with other mm -hmm. very useful things, but not much more. So this really does cover a lot. And uh, I think, so we had 75 students 
this past summer. So the process of training and taking into this area new talent, uh, not just from cryptography, but also from complexity or mathematics, has become a lot more attractive. And I think we're going to see mm -hmm. sort of an influx, not just thanks to this, but also thanks to this, of talent who is able to design uh, probabilistic proofs at a sort of high quality with tackling difficult questions. And it would really would not have been possible otherwise, because there's only so many experts, and so they have so much uh, advising bandwidth, and it doesn't scale. But uh, I think that uh, sort of having precise, deep, and uh, technical courses that are not trying to cover everything, like this course does not talk about all of the whole SNARS landscape, but specifically a coherent set of materials that does not require too much background, probabilistic proofs, does not require any cryptographic background, will help with uh, this periodical problem. For sure. But like you sort of mentioned here, you're tackling one part of a SNARK because that's the part that you feel could be described as foundational. What about all of the other stuff, like the things that are moving quickly? How does one get into that? I mean, we've had that question come up a number of times in our channels, people just being like, they are technical, they want to jump in, they don't know exactly where to start. It sounds like your course would be a great place to start, but once they do that, like how do they then understand the other parts that are changing? Well, the rest is a uh, <laughs> work in progress in a sense that it is a uh, work in progress by researchers because they are changing, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that there will be always changing, right? So more and more territories of the SNARG landscape will become uh, well understood uh, over time. So that's one aspect. And the other work in progress is that more pedagogical resources will become available. For example, Justin Thaler has a wonderful uh, monograph that uh, covers both SNARG compilers and a little bit of probabilistic proofs. So I don't cover anything in my course about cryptography. I just touch upon Killian's protocol and uh, using hash functions, but I don't talk about bullet proofs. I don't talk about uh, sort of uh, how you compile linear PCPs into pre-processing SNARGs, because that would require in the course bringing in or teaching about cryptographic background. But Justin has done a wonderful job assembling an extensive monograph that will help people uh, sort of understand the other parts that are not covered. And over time, this work in progress will mean that uh, experts might be finding opportunities to systematize, digest, and, and represent other pieces uh, necessary for uh, a full understanding of this area. And it will get better and better. Um, now, <laughs> yeah. So, but there's no, I would say there's no e easy silver bullet here in the sense that the research is still very active. So it's not like people are saying, well, you know, we got all the low hanging, medium hanging fruits. Let's just go and write books and tutorials because there's nothing better to do. Um, <laughs> in my research uh, group, we have plenty of exciting things we're always working on, and it seems that just they keep coming. And so um, the resources towards pedagogy are more an active effort, but they're not like the, the majority of uh, one's time because, you know, that's how it is. Uh, I feel like this thinking, though, intersects with the idea of standards, like ZK standards, standardization, sort of like decisions that like this is what is going to be used for now. Maybe that is more on the implementation side of things. But I know that there's a group like ZK Proofs. They do workshops and they actually focus on standards. And I did wonder from where you're sitting, like, what do you make of standardization bodies? Do you feel like those are good for research, bad for research? Like, yeah, how, how would you, like, do you want standards? Does that even factor in? I think standards okay. are wonderful, but they're more for industry, right? So I, I wouldn't say that uh, from a research perspective, they carry like a, a large um, sort of uh, impact. Uh, and you can see this also, forget yeah. standards, you know, sort of standards for encryption, standards for digital signature. They're not so much about uh, sort of uh, making the life of researchers easier. Rather, it is more about coming up with the references that practitioners can uh, uh, look up and not have to directly consult with uh, experts of the area, right? Mm. And similar for pedagogy, sometimes getting certain ideas across is not about what is the most efficient protocol, but rather what is the simplest protocol that captures the use of that idea to achieve a certain goal. And that helps you understand what is the power of that idea, okay? And so then you feel it and you're able to use it in other places. For example, you may be able to effectively use it to design practically efficient protocols. So in pedagogical resources, there is more of a push towards 
examples that illustrate challenges and how you overcome them with uh, specific ideas. Okay. But then those have to be presented in sort of the cleanest, most uh, sort of uh, unconcerned place, right? You shouldn't have to worry about other issues like how are you going to implement it? You know, how is it going to be efficient? Because you're trying to get across the power of a certain tool or what is a certain definition about uh, uh, about and how to understand it. So, and uh, for researchers and even practitioners, before they get to implementing, they want to understand what they're operating with, what they're working with. That's what you want, right? So that's uh, pedagogy is about uh, digesting, redigesting, redigesting, redigesting until it kind of explains itself, right? So um, like, for example, things that are topics in undergraduate textbooks for standard courses are there because they have been digested a million times and there are very effective ways to understand and motivate them and explain them to the point that people in their second and third year university can absorb them. Mm -hmm. It does not mean they were always like that. They were potentially much more complicated and better in not clear settings, maybe with additional bells and whistles that turned out they were not so important in the end, but it was a core idea that was much simpler. So something like that has to happen for SNARKs to create some sort of syllabus that will be widely accessible. And uh, what I've been trying to do with this course on probabilistic proofs is doing that thing, not for SNARKs, but specifically for probabilistic proofs, mm -hmm. where SNARKs are one of the major applications. And the course has gone through various iterations, and uh, at least I've learned a lot about uh, what works and what doesn't work, what is core material and what is less core material. So I, yeah, it's, it's a bit different than standards. One kind of last question that I have for you is, what is your motivation in doing this? Like, what is the thing about teaching, maybe specifically this, that excites you? Uh, I would say impact on uh, students. So I think that these topics around the succinct arguments and the uh, probabilistic proofs are beautiful, they're powerful, they're challenging, and uh, there's lots of talent out in the world. And uh, if uh, I can uh, improve the mechanisms and the uh, materials that bring in more talent, more people to think about these questions and uh, catalyze uh, faster progress in this area to maybe answer open questions uh, earlier rather than later, to then uh, cause uh, more technology transfer of these ideas, uh, maybe even far beyond blockchains. So this impact, I find it exciting, and you know, I cannot do it alone. Mm. I need uh, brilliant collaborators, but the brilliant collaborators you know, have to be interested in this and know about the topic. And so through the teaching and education, I can uh, effect change uh, onto others with respect to these topics. Is it partly that like there are things that you just want to know? Are you looking at like these are these unknowns that you just want to eventually know the answer to or see something like in a direction? Or is there any sort of like other maybe outside of math uh, reason that you that you want to see more development in this space? Well, so on the research side, yes, there's lots of questions that I would like <laughs> to know the answer of, you know, very viscerally, because they're very exciting. But maybe taking a step back, these topics, I find them exciting because they're just the, the goals that are achieved are magical. So many people are attracted to cryptography because it's kind of in some sense magic, right? You're able to do all this crazy sounding uh, goals like zero knowledge or exponentially fast verification, secure computation, uh, obfuscation. All of these capture the imagination of people. They're evocative and uh, you want to know how to do them. In my particular case, I find uh, this exponential speed up in uh, verification or computation to be, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's beautiful and- Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. And it's also powerful, like you can actually do you don't have to come up with uh, convoluted fairy tales about how it's useful in the real world. It's just useful. Like, in fact, mm -hmm. it's not just useful, it's direly, direly needed, okay? And what's exciting here is that somehow making progress on this topic brings you back to basic mathematical questions in computational complexity, property testing, and cryptography. And now you have this leverage, this powerful leverage that uh, theoretical ideas can push Boundary is not of knowledge, but of technology. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and it's something that you know you sometimes read about and you see in movies, maybe, but you never really feel. But when you feel it on your skin and you see the power that uh, foundational progress brings to technology later, then this is uh, 
definitely inebriating, right? And uh, so, yeah, to me, that's a strong motivation. When I talk to students, especially young ones, I tell them, you know, there's an infinitude of well-posed mathematical questions that one can work on. It, it does not mean that one should work on any one of them because some of them are silly mm. or just, I don't know, I mean, they're well-posed, but just why are you wasting your time on it, right? So given the limited amount of time that we all have, I would rather spend it on uh, questions that I find interesting and I think they are impactful. Do you ever have any concerns about some of the, like, cryptography? Like, would you ever be worried about something you built being used for bad? Does that ever come into your mind kind of from the research side? Yeah, it, it's not like, uh, I'll make an analogy, right? So people always say, oh, a knife, right? You can use it to, you know, cut vegetables or people, right? But I think the analogy here is more about uh, the raw materials for protocols, right? So maybe the wood that makes up the knife or the, the yeah. steel that makes up the knife. So snarks are so foundational that, you know, they are currently being used in certain protocols, but I think eventually it will be used in all kinds of settings. And there's such totally. a basic building block that uh, at least the way I feel it in my mind is uh, just so foundational that I don't really come up with considerations of sort. Very different is to say, if you start designing protocols that are achieving specific things, for example, there are legitimate questions to be raised about, uh, say, private peer-to-peer -peer payments, like a zero cash protocol, right? And so then the, the way to address them is to say, well, you know, that's, Maybe we should have some programmability that you know uh, in introduces some accountability into the system, and for such types of directions, then it becomes uh, I think a bit more subtle. You know, still proponent of privacy and the fact that mm -hmm. you start with privacy and then you build in accountability rather than you start uh, transparent with surveillance. Yeah. With it. So <laughs> I'll take always the trade off uh, more on the um, sort of on that side, but. Uh, when you're not really building protocols for specific security goals of like real world protocols, but basic cryptographic primitives, then uh, um, yeah, no, it's not, not something I really think about much. Do you think there are real opportunities for zero knowledge proofs to live? I mean, this show and a lot of the kind of community and everything, we tend to focus on the blockchain applications of zero knowledge. Like it's always in that intersection, almost always. I think I only have like one or two examples outside of it. But are you also looking towards or working towards non-blockchain zero knowledge? And maybe it's so foundational that you can't say like it could be used for blockchain or not blockchain. I don't know. I think it's too early to tell. I mean, so look, in principle, okay. I am convinced that uh, zero knowledge proofs and uh, succinct arguments will find plenty of applications beyond blockchain. Now, what are those? I don't know yet. I guess if I knew, maybe I would grab a few <laughs> friends and start a company in that direction. But um, also, you know, um, technology moves slow, which whatever we think of it, it usually does move slow, uh, especially when it's existing industries, right? So... Still, uh, snarks are not that old. Uh, like uh, I'm not old, and I've been working in snarks for longer. Been there, yeah. They've been, been worked on, right? So it will take more time. There are companies that tried to explore that direction, but uh, uh, you know it goes slow. And then uh, when you have um, opportunity cost of saying you could invest as a startup energy in the blockchain space and uh, have a much shorter time to market mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and cash and flow. And these interesting into, into the funding mechanisms, yeah. Right, as opposed to something more traditional, longer term, right? Maybe it even was going to work out, but simply the fact that you had a choice means that the development of a technology in the more traditional world will be delayed by the fact that there is a greater opportunity potentially in the blockchain space right now. Mm -hmm. But over time, I think this will kind of, I don't know if it will correct itself, but just like through the statistics and uh, serendipity, more applications will come up. Very cool. So I am absolutely positive that they will. I don't know exactly when and in what form. Nice. Ale, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Yeah, no, thank you so much. It was uh, lovely to be back. It's always uh, a lot of fun uh, to chit chat about uh, Snarks with you. And uh, there's plenty of things that we could have talked and we didn't have time, but uh, for the audience, if they're interested <laughs> to follow more of the research uh, coming out of my um, research group, then uh, you can sort of Google my name and find my webpage. It's usually up to date in terms of recent papers. You can also look up the um, summer school and the videos and problem sets there. And uh, 
I continue to do research and some of my students have graduated. And uh, as always, I'm looking for strong and brilliant uh, students and postdocs who may be also interested in probabilistic proofs and succinct arguments. So if you're interested to talk about opportunities to work with me, I can hire you if there's a good match. So uh, write me an <laughs> cool. email and uh, you can find the email on, on my webpage. Very cool. All right. So I want to say thank you to the podcast editor, Henrik, the podcast producer, Tanya, and to our listeners. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.